Today I want to clear up some of the most common myths surrounding EQ. Why? Well, EQ or equalization is one of the most powerful tools we have in our arsenal when it comes to music production. But there are so many different EQs out there and so much conflicting advice on the internet, it can easily become overwhelming and I wanted to simplify things for you today. There are also a lot of myths and advice out there that actually annoy me because it causes so much confusion. Now please bear in mind these are just my opinions. You might completely disagree with them, but what I recommend is you try them on for size and see if they work for you because they've Help me and my students get signed and released on some of the world's biggest labels. I've also put together a free EQ guide which you can download and refer to when you're producing your next track. So the first myth that isn't really told to people but a lot of people seem to naturally believe it is that EQ can fix anything. Now I've got a personal story about this but before we dig in let's quickly recap what an EQ does and what the controls do. So in a nutshell EQs simply control the volume of different frequencies. With the normal volume control when you're turning it up or down you're changing the volume of the entire frequency range. Whereas EQ devices allow you to focus in on specific frequencies and turn them up or down. Simple, right? More or less, and we'll get into that in a minute. So let's have a quick look at the basic controls of pretty much any EQ. So I'm going to use the FabFilter Pro Q3 for this example, just because it's got a nice big display. But the Ableton stock plugin parametric EQ is the EQ8, and in Logic Pro it's the channel EQ. They both do what I'm about to show you. So the five main controls that you're likely to come across in an equalizer is the shape of the dip or cut you are going to use, the frequency that you want to affect, the gain, which controls how much you cut or boost that frequency by and the Q value which determines how narrow or how broad that cut or boost is. Now this example right here is what's known as a parametric EQ and there are a few other types of EQs which we're going to touch upon in a couple of minutes. So as I said at the beginning of this section EQ is a powerful tool but it can't fix every problem. For example poorly selected sounds, a poorly recorded track or bad performance can't be fixed with EQ. Also you might just need to use another tool altogether which we'll touch upon in a few minutes but the closer you you can get to your sounds working together before you even reach for an EQ, the better final result you're likely to end up with. Think of a standard rock band. There's a guitarist, the vocalist, the bass guitar and the drums. These sounds all fit together in the frequency spectrum and work well without any kind of EQ whatsoever. That's why you can listen to them in a live gig playing together and it already works. Of course in the studio you're going to be able to get more from them with EQ, but the tonality and the timbre of these different instruments already sound good when they're played together. And it's exactly the same in a electronic music. So let's listen to an example of a track with poorly selected sounds that we've tried to EQ to sound good and another version of the same track with well selected sounds but no EQ. So this is the version with the sounds that aren't great but we have got EQ and no amount of EQ is going to get these sounds to work together well. So now let's listen to this track but with better sound selected but no EQ. So we've switched out the drums We've switched out the plaques and turned off all the EQ, but all the sounds just complement each other frequency-wise. But now let's listen to this with the EQs turned on to hear what we can add. So we're just adding a little bit of sparkle, cleaning up the mix and helping it shine, but we can only help it shine because it was an already good product. Now this realization is probably the one thing that made the biggest difference to the quality of my music and when I started spending more time on the sound selection at the beginning of the production process, previewing different sounds against each other, writing little lists of my top six or seven sounds then choosing the strongest of those, my music quality took a massive leap and there wasn't even an EQ in sight. Now it can be tempting to think you need to reach for an EQ straight away because it's natural once you get to learn new tools you want to put them on everything and we have a habit of kind of overusing them but EQ should be thought of more as a polishing tool when you've already got the right ingredients. Which brings me on to myth number two. EQ plugins only control frequencies. Now most people think that EQs just control the volumes of the frequencies of the sound because they do, but that's not all they do. Whilst it's true of some EQs and I'll show you exactly which ones in a minute, other EQs can actually impart their own tonality to a sound, perhaps by adding some harmonic distortion, a little bit of compression, which can all add up to the character of the mix. So here's an example of one sound Sound run through three different EQs and listen carefully to the tone in each example. Second EQ. And the third EQ. Something 
Did you hear the difference? Well, the chances are you probably didn't. At least not in the first two, perhaps a little bit in the third. So which EQs affect sounds in which ways? And does this mean that we need loads of different EQs to get a pro sound? Well, I actually don't think so. And this brings me on to myth number three. You need loads of different EQ plugins to sound pro. So as you're probably already aware, and if you're not now, then you certainly will be soon, music production is a complicated process and there is a lot to learn. But one of the biggest sticking points for new producers is that when they realize there's so much to learn, that can often be disheartening and it makes them want to give up. So let me make things simple for you now. You don't need loads of EQs. You can do everything you need with two types of EQs and more likely probably just one. And there are four main different categories of EQs in my estimation, so we'll quickly run through them and I'll point out the ones that you probably need if you're fairly new to production. The first is a digital parametric EQ and the one that you're going to have already bundled with your DAW. Ableton Live has EQ8, Logic Pro has the channel EQ, and if you have got a third party one, a very popular one is the FabFilter Pro Q3. It just allows a bit more control and it's got some more features than the standard stock ones. These are great for dialing in exact frequencies and being very accurate with your cuts and boosts, and they tend not to impart much character on the sound, so we call that transparent. Now the second main type of EQ is a dynamic EQ, and this is one where we can choose to reduce the volume of a certain frequency only when it goes above a certain threshold. Now the Pro Q3 has these features as well, but I'm going to keep things simple for you. If you're just starting out or it's been one year you've been producing, the only kind of dynamic EQ that you'll probably need is a de for vocals. And what a dynamic EQ is that when a specific frequency hits above a certain volume, then it starts working. Now this is really useful because if you want to take just the S's of a vocal, the S sounds, down, you might not want to take that frequency down for the entire duration of the vocal, just when those really loud S's play. So this is the kind of effect it has. And we can see when she sings S, it starts ducking that volume slightly. Let's make it more pronounced so we can really hear the effect. Take the threshold down. And now we can hear it's too much. So this is off. You can really hear the S and this is on. Dynamic EQ is a really useful tool, but as I said, you probably don't need it other than for DSing vocals until you've been producing for a while. Using dynamic EQs all over your mix is probably going to lead to more problems than solutions, unless you know exactly what you're doing. Now, the third type of EQ is an analog modeled EQ, and there are so many different types that you can get, and they model real EQ devices, so they tend to impart warmth into the sound because they're replicating the circuitry that the audio signal is being pushed through. They tend to give a more pleasing music sound to the boosts and cuts, adding a little bit of saturation or harmonic distortion, and sometimes even a little bit of compression. Once again though, as we looked at at the last point, it's quite hard to tell the difference until your ears are at a particular level. So I would just recommend like ignoring all of these, because you can get a truly pro sound just using the stock parametric EQ that you have, and a de if you're working with vocals. Now the fourth type of EQ is really more of a feature within certain EQs, and it's called mid-side EQ. Again, honestly something you do not need to worry about if you've been producing for less than a year but I know some of you are going to insist in the comments that I cover mid-side EQ so here we go and if you are new to music production please for your own sanity cover your ears for the next 20 seconds <clears throat> Whether or not a sound is mono or stereo is due to the difference between the left and the right channel. If both channels are the same, the sound occurs as mono. If the left and the right channels differ, it occurs as stereo. Midside EQ simply switches between the portion of the signal that is the same, known as the mid, and the portion of the sound that differs, known as the sides. Note that mid has nothing to do with mid frequencies, but rather mid in the sense of the stereo field. But when should it be used? Midside EQ is useful if you want to alter a sound's side signals independently from the mid signals, or vice versa. It can be great for adding a little bit of extra sparkle to the size of your reverb channel or for very specific and deliberate EQ work on specific sounds. You can also use it on your master channel to roll off some of the lows in the side channels to avoid mud in the mix. There you go, you asked for it, you can't unask. Now back to the main video. So this categorization should make your life a little bit easier. You just need one EQ in each category and if you've only been producing for a year, just get one parametric EQ, you've already got one, and a de if you're working with vocals. And that takes me on to myth number four always cut never boost and this is a myth kind of ish 
Well, let's go back to what EQ essentially does. It's a volume control for specific frequency bands. So if you were to boost these frequencies, but reduce the whole volume, that is, in effect, just the same as reducing these frequencies. So it's important to understand what's going on before we can make sweeping statements like never boost, only cut. But now for the ish. When you compose a track, there are lots of overlapping frequencies of sounds. And that's actually a good thing. If every sound occupied only its own frequency range and nothing overlapped, it would sound very, very unnatural. We humans exist in a world where we hear overlapping frequencies and sounds all the time, but we still cherish being able to tell them apart from each other. That's why we can get really overwhelmed if we're in a very crowded environment, lots of people are talking, and it's just too much for our brain to work out what we should be listening to. So, some overlapping frequencies are obviously a good thing. For example, my voice will share some frequencies with a guitar, and also a piano, and also a snare drum. But this does mean that there are often frequencies that aren't the main bit of the sound that are simply unnecessary and that will end up clogging up the mix. And these are generally the most important frequencies to focus on cutting first before you add any boosts. And here are a couple of examples. So here we've got an open hat and we can see there's a lot of information down at 50 hertz, 60 hertz. You know, we just don't need that. It's going to clog up the mix. So we can put a high pass filter quite high up, you know, six, seven hundred, and still keep the character of the sound and just get rid of everything that we don't need, which is going to allow more space in our mix for the other instruments. Here's another example with a pad sound. So we can see there's a lot going on down below 100 hertz. That's going to fight with our bass. So we can just take out everything under 120 hertz or so. So here's another good example. We've got some vocals for this track. And if we bring on a parametric EQ, I think we need to cut some of it, but we also want to boost it a bit as well. So it gets a bit harsh there. I think there's a resonant frequency, so I'll just take that down a bit. That a U bit there. So let's just. We've just made it a bit smoother. But I also want to take out some of these bass frequencies because they're going to be fighting with our bass, fighting with our pads. We'll do this in situ, like so. See how much space we've just cleared. But. I do want to boost her very high breathy air frequencies because I just want it to pop through the mix a bit. So let's just boost these high, really high frequencies first on their own. So we've gone from this, a bit harsh, to this. So whilst cutting frequencies is super important because you want to get rid of the information that you don't need, sometimes boosting frequencies is the right move, but usually I would say after cutting the unwanted frequencies. Now you may have noticed that I high passed all of those sounds as a starting point, which brings me neatly on to the next myth. High pass everything except the kick and bass. Now, this isn't actually a myth. In fact, it's kind of a really good idea, but there are caveats that we have to take into consideration. It has to be done carefully as some sounds will lose their power if rolled off too high. For example, if I roll these vocals off at this point, it gets rid of the muddy frequencies and sounds good in the mix. But if I rolled it off too high, They sound too tinny. And this applies to everything that isn't the kick and the bass that you do want to be rolling off the low end with, even with the hi-hats. So for example, with this hi-hat here, if I roll this off too high, it's going to lose its character. If I roll these stabs off too high, they'll lose their character. But I do want to be taking out under about that point, I should think. And what happens if you roll everything off just a little bit too high is that you can end up with a weak and tinny mix that just lacks body. So there's no one size fits all solution, but here are some rules of thumb that could help. One, melodic instruments such as guitars and pianos can usually be rolled off at about 100 hertz. Male vocals can be rolled off at about 70 to 80 hertz and female vocals about 100 hertz without losing the body, but still allowing space in the mix. Number three, be careful when rolling off the low end of the top 
tom drum because those drums do need some low end. But you do want to clean up the sub frequencies that aren't being used because we just want the kick and the bass to be doing that job. Pretty much all the other drums can be rolled off at 120 hertz or even higher if it's things like hats. And then fifth, remember things like booms and hall kicks have to be treated separately because we do want sub information in them, but usually they're quite quiet in the mix anyway, perhaps just playing in a break. So more often than not, you can get away with pretty much not rolling them off at all at the low end. I'd also say the lower down that you're rolling off those bass frequencies, be careful of using really, really steep curves like 96 decibels like this, as it can start to sound a bit strange. So when you're rolling off the low end, just experiment with 18, 24, maybe 30 decibel curve as a max. Again, these are just rules of thumb, experiment and pick what works well for you. As a general rule of thumb though, take out everything that's not needed in the low end and nothing more, but that's easier said than done, which brings me nicely onto our next myth, which really makes me angry. This is the one that annoys me the most, and that is trust your ears. I hate this, it's such a cop out. Your ears aren't trustworthy, yet. If they were, then you wouldn't be watching this video. And that's fine, it's way better to know our weaknesses so we can find a way to work around them and strengthen them. And not only are your ears not completely trustworthy because they change throughout the day and as you get older, but also your headphones and your monitors and the room in which you're producing, none of them are trustworthy. They all reproduce sounds differently from other systems, which is why I really, really recommend and referencing and using reference tracks to guide you when it comes to EQ. So here's how I use reference tracks and spectrum analyzers to help me EQ. So for this technique, you're gonna have to create a new audio channel and bring in a reference track. And what we're really looking for is something in a very similar style to the music that you're making because it's gonna have similar sounds and therefore a similar frequency range. Now we can't get this exactly right, but it can really help our ears, especially when it comes to learning how to EQ. So if we look at our track that we have just loaded in, there are a few plugins I've got on the channel. I've got a mono switch to change it to mono, which can again make it easier for my ears to focus on the frequencies. We've got a frequency referencing roll off, which I'm gonna show you what it does in a few minutes. We've also got a loudness meter, which we don't need to worry about too much today. And we've also got a spectrum analyzer here. I'm using Span by Voxengo, it's completely free. I'll put a link to it below this video. Now what I've done is synchronized up this track to our project so we can loop everything nicely. And then what we want to do is try and get our levels of frequencies similar to that of our reference track. And you can use this for any stage of the process. If you find a part of your reference track where there are fewer elements playing, you can just focus in on those elements if that's exactly what you want to do. But we're gonna look at the whole track today. So we've got our reference track. But let's go back to the busy bit with all the high frequencies too. And now let's switch to our track. Okay, so I think ours sounds a little bit duller but I want to check and see what's going on visually as well. So this is when I can open up the span, the spectrum analyzer on our reference track, like so. And then I can open that up on our track as well. So I put one on our master channel. Let's open them up to be about the same size, as close as possible. And on the left, we've got our reference track and on the right is our track. So we can see what's going on and we can look our low end is hitting about the right point. But I think our high end, you can see here, this area is a little bit quieter than here. So we might put on an EQ and just boost some of those high frequencies. And I'm gonna do this through the entire mixing process and just switching between the two. And just trying to hear if I'm matching things up. Now, if you really want to focus down on particular frequencies, this is something else you can do. On the reference track, you remember we've got this reference roll off, which again is just another EQ that I've put a low pass filter on and we can just roll off some of the frequencies until we've just got down to the kick and the boom, like this. So if we want to match our low end and see if we can EQ it correctly, we're gonna use this exact same frequency roll off, 122, Hertz, so let's program this into ours. And now we can see how ours is hitting. So we've got different kinds of bass lines. So this isn't the ideal reference track because we can see here on our reference track, we've actually got these bass notes hitting, whereas ours, 
we don't really because it's more of a techno rumble but it's just going to show how you can use EQs to actually help focus on seeing the difference as well as hearing the difference now conversely you could want to focus on the high end so all we'd have to do is turn off that low pass filter and put on a high pass filter and find the point where we want to focus So if we want to focus on everything above 2 kilohertz, we can just put that same setting into our track, like so, about 2 kilohertz. It's going to allow us to hear and see what's going on. And if you start using this technique when it comes to EQing, it will make a massive difference to the quality and the frequency spread of your mixes. Now the last two myths are equally as insidious as the first six if taken at face value, and they will cripple your chances of creating a clean, well EQ'd mix. So the seventh myth is that you should automate your EQ. This is when you decide to use automation to change the settings of your EQ at different points in the mix. Now, okay, once again, the caveat is for sure if you know what you're doing and you can use this technique to get the last five percent out of your mix then absolutely of course go ahead and automate your eq but what i've personally often found is that if you find the right sound and you eq it properly for a particular point in your track it should pretty much work with those settings for the rest of the track now again if you are just going for that extra one percent of quality out of your mix and you've been doing this for a couple of years it can make a slight difference but more often than not what happens is much like all of the different analog EQs that you can pick, people think that this is the thing that's going to make their music sound good, and it is absolutely not. So I recommend just looping the main part of your track, perhaps the chorus or the drop, and just EQing your elements so they all sound great in that point. When you've done that, your static mix, just leave those settings for the sound in the rest of the track. If you want to take out some low end or high end, just use a filter sweep, but that's more of a creative effect than EQing per se. And the last myth that I want to share with you today is something that I just think is silly, right? People say don't EQ while soloed because you want that element to sound good with the rest of the track. But if everything else is playing, it's so hard to hear what frequencies you have to remove from that sound. And I don't know any producers that don't use the solo button to try and get a sound sounding good on its own and then to mix it with the rest of the track. Now, of course, at that point, you are going to have to make some tweaks. And I recommend using my top down mixing approach where you basically mix in the most important elements in order. And that really clears up a lot of confusion when it comes to what to mix in what order so you'd mix the kick the bass line the main clap or snare the rest of the drums your main lead synth or vocal in that order just EQing them each so they fit in with the elements that you've already mixed that sound really good together and there are two more things that I do want to touch upon that are crucial for getting an absolutely pro sounding mix but they aren't really myths so I wanted to kind of separate them out as bonuses the first is why you find it hard to EQ properly and that's probably because you're not using gain staging so if you're boosting or cutting with an EQ, that's going to change the volume of the sound because you're taking the volume down of certain frequencies. All we need to do is make sure that we are volume matching the signal coming out from the EQ as the one going into the EQ. This means that when we bypass it and AB test, turn it on and off, we can actually hear the difference that the EQ is making rather than just hearing a volume boost or a volume cut, which can kind of confuse our ears. The second bonus reason as to why you might find it hard to EQ properly is because maybe you shouldn't be using EQ at all. Sometimes it's just not the right tool for a job. I mean, you wouldn't fry an egg using a blowtorch, would you? Would you? Disclaimer, please don't try and fry an egg with a blowtorch. But there are other important tools that might be the right ones to go for to get the exact effect you need. And one of them is very likely to be compression. Now, much like EQ, there are myths abound on the internet, throwing people off the scent, confusing things when it comes to compression. So I've put together the biggest myths I've heard over the last 25 years, and I clear them up once and for all so you'll be able to use compression with your new EQ skills like an absolute pro. So if you enjoyed this video please consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you over at that next video.